Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second non-urban passenger transport session of our Outlook launch. A warm welcome to those of you who have just joined the program. My name is Malithi Fernando, and I am a co-author and the project manager for this edition of the Outlook. It is my pleasure to be moderating this session today. You will be hearing shortly from my colleagues Demetrius Papayuano and Vatsalia Sohu, who will present our findings on the future of the non-urban passenger transport sector. After that, we have the great privilege of being joined by our special guest, Andrea Schaefer, who is a professor of energy and transport at University College London. He will be joining us for an interactive discussion that you will have a chance to participate in if you answer the poll question that is on the right-hand side of your screen. That'll feed into the discussion. Finally, for the last portion, we will be joined by Luis Martinez, the lead modeler at the ITF, who will join Demetrius and Vatsalia for a series of uh, questions. So you're welcome to submit questions ahead of time in the, using the Q&A box. It's on the right-hand corner of your screen as well. The poll question is there. You'll also find a discussion box. This discussion box is for you to chat with other participants, respond to what you're hearing. Um, it will not be moderated by ITF staff. So if you want to ask a question, please do use the Q&A function. Finally, if you are experiencing technical difficulties, please use the live support button in the top right hand corner of your screen for assistance. And with that, I will hand the floor to Demetrius to kick off our presentations. Thank you very much, Malithi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I will be presenting now the main findings and the key takeaways from our uh, chapter on non-urban passenger transport. Now, what is non-urban passenger transport? It is important to define that. Uh, what we mean by this expression is all passenger activity which happens outside and between cities. So when we're talking outside of cities, we call that regional transport. We are talking about rural and peri-urban movements that happen by surface modes. We're talking about daily trips that people living in these areas do. When we're talking about intercity transport, that is movements between cities, we are talking about travel that happens between cities by surface modes, ferry, or air. Now, why is non-urban passenger important? First of all, it represents more than half, about 60% of all passenger activity and the corresponding emission. Second of all, it is important, to, it is a sector that is notoriously difficult to decarbonize at least some parts of it, because it is much more dependent on fossil fuels. and, and Last but not least, it has been significantly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Overall, activity on the sector reduced by almost 40%. Aviation, as you probably know, was particularly affected by the pandemic. Uh, it had a reduction of total activity by almost 60%. More importantly, when looking at the international aviation segment, it was even more affected by border closures, quarantine requirement, leading to a total reduction of almost 75%. Now, let me recap very briefly the three policy scenarios that we have tested in this outlook. First of all, we have the recover scenario. This scenario represents our current trajectory. It talks about the policies that are currently in place or are announced, they are planned to be put in place in the future. Then we have the reshape scenario, which talks about the paradigm shift. It talks about scaling up our ambition, implementing more, uh, more policies with higher, uh, with higher ambition. Uh, I need to point out that in both these scenarios, the effects of the pandemic uh, are not visible beyond 2030. Um, the transport sector and the economy recover. That is slightly different on the reshape scenario where some of the after effects of the pandemic linger on, but they are leveraged in a positive way in order to accelerate the uptake and deployment of decarbonization policies. And through this scenario and through these assumptions, it helps us reach our climate goals faster and with more certainty. Now I will present some of our key facts, key findings that came from our work on the outlook. First of all, let's talk about demand. Demand measured in passenger kilometers. So demand for the sector 
both in regional and intercity travel will grow. It will grow regardless of scenario. As you can see on the figure shown on your screen, uh, the demand will more than double. And the difference between the two scenarios that are shown here, the recover and the reset plus is very small. So this signifies how demand management for the sector for regional intercity travel is particularly difficult. However, if we look, the growth is asymmetrical between OECD and non-OECD countries. In countries of the OECD, the growth in non-urban passenger transport is around 40 to 45% in both these scenarios. By contrast, the demand for regional and intercity travel in non-OECD country almost triples. This highlights a departure from OECD countries being the center of non-urban activity globally. By 2050, the developing nations that are part of the non-OECD group will generate the majority of non-urban passenger activity. How does that translate in emission? Well, depending on the policies taken, CO2 emissions from the sector could either rise or fall. And as you see in the graph, under the current policies, under the recover scenarios, the emissions will grow by as much as 25% compared to 2015 levels. Of course, this is a relative reduction compared to demand growth, which more than doubles. So some of the policies and technologies that are under development uh, will have an impact on emissions. However, emissions will st still rise. Nonetheless, if more ambitious policies are put in place and combined with the COVID-19 recovery, we could reduce CO2 emissions by as much as 57%. So it is important to point out how this, uh, this sector is really at a crossroad. We could either go one direction where emission will continue to grow or in a different direction where higher ambition and combination of the lingering effects, the after effects of the pandemic and the recovery packages could reduce emissions drastically. Finally, let's talk about aviation. Aviation, as we mentioned before, is a sector that has been hit particularly hard from the pandemic. However, according to our projections, it will recover. By 2025, aviation demand will be at pre-pandemic levels. Looking forward by 2050, air travel could triple compared to the 2015 values. As you can see in the two scenarios here, the growth is slightly bigger on the current trajectory. And this, this represents number of trends that are taken into account for the Resape Plus scenario. These trends such as teleconferencing and increased localized tourism re reduce overall aviation demand. But we must also point out that this reduction is also a result of other policies which favor and encourage uh, surface travel, especially for short distance trips. Now with this, uh, I finish my, uh, I finish my, the key facts I had to say, and I will give the floor to my colleague Vatsalia Soho. Thank you so much, Dimitris, for those very insightful findings. Uh, as Dimitris mentioned, carbon emissions from this sector could be about 57% lower in 2050 as compared to 2015, with ambitious policies that leverage the decarbonization opportunities of the COVID-19 recovery. I will now present our key takeaways in this context. To begin with, our results show that technological improvements offer the most promising path to achieve the targets in this sector. This can be explained through applying the avoid shift and prove approach in this context. So, avoiding travel by leveraging, leveraging the trends that have emerged in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, promoting local tourism and encouraging teleworking and video conferencing to avoid business trips. Shifting to cleaner modes. So substituting high-speed rail for short-haul flights. This can be encouraged through designing recovery packages that help shift travel from air to rail. And we've already seen this, for example, with the French recovery package. And lastly, improving energy efficiency. For road transport, this can mean promoting the use of more energy efficient vehicles. And for aviation, this can mean encouraging new aircraft designs, the development of hybrid and electric aircraft, and increasing the use of sustainable aviation fuel mandate, uh, fuels through mandates. Moving on, uh, to ensure uh, the transition to a low carbon mobility, 
it is important to increase customer, con uh, customer confidence in cleaner technologies and also to push for a cleaner energy grid. Now, in order to increase consumer confidence, it is important to deploy charging infrastructure along intercity and regional networks to overcome range anxiety and accelerate adoption. Major push can also come from incentives. This can be purchase subsidies and tax rebates and exemptions for electric vehicles. Specifically targeting rapid electrification of high usage fleets, for example, taxis and ride hailing fleets can also have a big impact. Secondly, pursuing a cleaner energy grid is key as regional travel comes to rely more and more on electricity. Without green electricity generation, transport emissions will simply shift to the energy sector instead of being mitigated. Emerging economies, which are still dependent on fossil fuels for power generation, must prioritize, prioritize the transition to a greener grid. Last, but certainly not the least, putting a price on carbon will discourage high emission transport and make cleaner alternatives more attractive. Here, carbon taxes can play a very important role in making the CO2 intensive transport internalize the environmental as well as societal cost of carbon emissions. Additionally, for a just transition, it is important to design revenue neutral and fair schemes so as to not leave behind the less affluent. Lower income groups often bear the brunt of regressive taxation. Hence, it is essential to design these packages in a way that avoids unfair burdens on the vulnerable groups. This can also mean using revenue from carbon pricing to fund incentives for clean mobility so as to increase the accept acceptability of these alternatives. Now to quickly summarize, we see from our findings that the demand for regional and intercity travel will continue to grow strongly regardless of the scenario. We also see a rebound in aviation and continued growth till 2050. This means that decoupling emissions from travel demand will be crucial and it is possible to reduce emissions in this sector by 57% by 2050, only by deploying ambitious policies and leveraging the recovery from the pandemic. As mentioned, this can be achieved through measures like increased deployment of technological improvements and ensuring consumer confidence in them, greening the electricity grid and implementing carbon taxation schemes that prioritize equity. I finish here and I would like to thank you all very much for your time. And with that, I hand it back to our colleague Maliti. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vatsalia and Demetrius for sharing those findings with us. We are now going to be joined by Professor Andreas Schaefer, who will be starting off our discussion, looking at options to decarbonize one of the most difficult sectors, aviation. So Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maliti. It's a it's a pleasure to to participate in this in this uh, interesting um, session. Now, having having participated in the in the, in the previous uh, or looked at attended the previous session and, and and this one, the you know the differences could hardly be larger. In in urban transport, you can substitute almost everything. You can substitute the mode. You can substitute the fuel. You can substitute the layout of the infrastructure. Now this this it's still hard to reduce emissions, of course, but this this luxury luxury condition does not exist in in non-urban transport, as it as has already been mentioned by Dimitris and and Vatsala. Um, nevertheless, um, there are opportunities, and and the outlook uh, summarizes this uh, quite nicely. Um, and and the key opportunity here is certainly on surface transportation. In, in terms of reducing the related CO2 emissions, because the technologies in order to make a difference, they are all commercially available. Um, they may still be a little bit expensive in terms of battery electric vehicles, but the, the, the battery technology continues to improve, the costs come down, and it may just be a question of time, or it, it will be just a question of time as policies are already in place, once electric vehicles take over and displace internal combustion engine uh, vehicles. And then as has already been mentioned, it depends on the, uh, on, on, on the CO2 intensity of the power grid um, that will then ultimately determine uh, CO2 emissions. So, so that's good news. But, but the bad news here is that there's a mode shift from, from surface transportation to air transportation and, and the relative importance of air transportation and the absolute importance, of course, uh, continues to increase. And, and that's worrying from an environmental perspective. 
Uh, first of all, it's a it's a very uh, stable trend, um, as as the outlook shows. You can restrict passenger choices quite significantly with respect to long distance travel, and nevertheless, demand for air transportation continues to increase. So, so you can make the argument, if behavior doesn't change, technology must, and and it also must change uh, in the air transportation sector because of its. Uh, of its, uh, uh, um, you know, relative uh, importance uh, as it as it is the leading uh, um, supply system, transportation supply system in in intercity travel. Um, so so um, if if technology has to make the difference, then 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 we come to the real challenge, namely that while technologies that make a difference are commercially available in surface transportation they are not at air transportation. We can think about beautiful technologies that make a difference, but they first have to be developed. Um, they have to be uh, uh, um, you know, produced at scale. And then we need uh, to allow for time, a sufficient amount of time for these technologies to enter the market. And we've got the year 2021 now, and, and by 2050, we need to be close to or at zero CO2 emissions. So that's an enormous challenge. Now, what, what technology solutions can we think about? Well, I can think about two fundamental options. The first one is we continue with improving mainstream aircraft technology as we did in the past. And these improvements have been quite significant. They have just been outpaced by the strong demand growth. But we develop carbon neutral synthetic hydrocarbon fuels at very large scale, at gigawatt scale. And again, these technologies are not proven at that scale. Now these fuels, they can be produced from biomass, uh, mainly cellulosic or woody biomass because uh, these feedstocks are comparatively abundant and don't directly interfere with our food supply. All these fuels can also be produced from hydrogen and carbon monoxide mixtures. That's proven technology, but first you need to get the carbon mono, you need to produce the carbon monoxide. And the way to do it in a carbon neutral way is to, ex to extract the CO2 from the atmosphere and then catalytically reduce it to carbon monoxide. That's not proven at scale. There are only pilot plants operating at very small uh, levels. Now, each of these two, uh, options has advantages and disadvantages. But again, common to both of them is that they are not proven at scale. Now, alternatively, we can develop different type of aircraft, in this case, hydrogen aircraft. Um, now, this is technologically extremely challenging, but there is no be possible from an engineering perspective. But this requires a completely new uh, supply system. And supply system in this case you know, includes fuel production, distribution, and storage, and the aircraft themselves. And all airports, of course, would have to be retrofitted accordingly. And, and um, these uh, hydrogen aircraft could start coming online in 2035. Now, replacing the existing jet engine aircraft by 2050 would be would be quite a stretch, especially given the long lifetime of, of the assets in place. So uh, aircraft on average live for around uh, 30 years on average. This means after 30 years, only half of the cohort is withdrawn. So introducing aircraft today, half of those would still be flying in 2050. So you would need to retire, early retire, um, uh, relatively new aircraft and, and sufficiently quickly uh, design and produce alternative vehicles, which is again, quite a challenge. Now, pursuing any of these two options, you know, either um, you know, continuously improving mainstream aircraft technology and changing the fuel in terms of producing synthetic hydrocarbon fuels or changing everything with respect to moving towards a hydrogen economy is highly capital intensive. And this situation uh, is not eased by the COVID situation because the market capitalization of the critical companies has dropped significantly between 50 and 70%. They have hardly funds to keep the lights on. So 
industry will not be able to make significant investments. And these investments, they're in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So this means government has to take a leading role, at least initially until industry has, has recovered and can participate in making these, these very capital intensive investments. Now there are isolated examples you know, in France and Germany and the UK in terms of supporting uh, the development of, of these new clean technologies, but that's only a, a drop in the ocean. The, the, the requirements for capital are significantly large. And again, this must be hundreds of, million, of, of billions of, of uh, euros. Um, so they have to be increased. And importantly, given what's at stake, these efforts, they need to be uh, coordinated uh, internationally. And, and I think that's, that's my main comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, that uh, you certainly laid out some of the challenges uh, and some of the potential solutions for the aviation industry, and uh, especially coming out of this pandemic. Um, so perhaps I will now take this opportunity while we have all of um, all the presenters and Andreas on screen to take a look at the poll results. Um, let me just close that and share them. We have very different results from what we had in our morning session. So. The question is, where does the biggest opportunity lie to decarbonize non-urban passenger transport? And with 40% of the votes, we have infrastructure developments. Uh, so this is ultra high speed rail, charging infrastructure for road vehicles, et cetera. And um, we, the others are, oh, sorry, the, the next one down is the engine and fuel efficiency improvements across all modes, so aviation, road, et cetera. And uh, with no votes is the development and uptake of policies mandating blend in fuels. These are very interesting results. Uh, I think in the morning we had quite a popular set of choices for demand management and alternative powertrains. So um, first off, Andreas, I'll, I'll turn to you to comment on perhaps our most popular options, infrastructure development and engine fuel efficiency, or perhaps uh, why you might find those surprising or if you have any alternative thoughts. I, I'm my my um, brief discourse must have been terribly inefficient, ineffective, because I was I was hoping to make the case that we actually need uh, enormous investments in alternative fuels. Efficiency improvements are important, of course, and 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 they have been occurring in the past. At the moment, around two percent per year on a fleet level, and they will continue to happen simply because airlines they they try to minimize their their direct operating costs in order to be profitable um in in terms of um high speed rail and the like um, wherever there's an opportunity and 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 it makes economic sense it should certainly be pursued but there are many places in which um you know substituting air travel by high-speed rail is simply not feasible, at least not at scale. If you look at the US, for example, there are, you know, there are a number of, of 10, 12 high-speed rail corridors on the East Coast and West Coast, and, and you know, some high-speed rail already exists on the East Coast. But that's about it, because they, they run through high population density areas, or they run between, between you know, cities that are sufficiently large in order to generate the demand, for example, you know, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles. But, but the air transportation system is highly dispersed. There are many flights to less populated areas in, in remote regions where high-speed rail is just a big no-no because the enormous capital investments would never ever be recovered. And that's the vast majority of passenger flows that we are talking about. Um, in, in terms of... Um, the combination of the three, well, yeah, I, I believe we should pursue all, all of these uh, options and, and uh, uh, wherever, again, wherever it, it makes economic sense to introduce high-speed rail. Uh, of course, for surface transportation, we need more charging stations uh, for, for better electric vehicles and the like, but that seems to be a question of time. Again, engine efficiency improvements are important. They will happen anyway, but we need to change the CO, the CO2 intensity of, of the energy carrier that we consume. And, and that only is possible with moving or shifting towards uh, low carbon fuels. 
Thank you very much, Andres. Demetrius, would you like to come in with some thoughts on these results? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, and may I add, because I was watching the poll, I believe most of the respondents gave the response before uh, your section, Andrea. So I don't think you failed in convincing them. Um, we, I mean, maybe we can relaunch it, you never know. Uh, so I will agree with most of the points that Andreas made. Uh, I do believe we need um, a multiple uh, point strategy. You need to put infrastructure where it's in place, uh, such as high-speed rail. Uh, we definitely need to have the charging infrastructure along our intercity and regional road network. Perhaps this would be a way to reverse the trend that we mentioned. As we see more and more intercity travel happens by air, perhaps if these alternatives exist, you could reverse or halt this trend. Uh, however, I also do agree with Andreas that we do need to reduce the intensity, the carbon intensity that comes out of aircraft because for many, for most um, transport, especially when we're looking at distances above 1,000, 2,000 kilometers, air travel is the only option. We must, of course, also look at possibilities on managing that demand, whether that demand can be sifted. But as we have seen and mentioned, this there is little potential for that on the sector. Thank you, Demetrius. Um, so I think that brings us to the close of our discussion section. Um, I would just like to ask that perhaps Andreas stay with us for a quick, uh, for a quick moment while we uh, move to the Q&A session so that we can ask you a couple of questions as well. Um, but I will now uh, introduce Luis Martinez, our lead modeler, who will be joining us to take some of uh, your questions. So please feel free to keep, um, to keep adding questions in the Q&A box. But to, but to get us started, I will kind of continue some of the conversation around sustainable aviation fuels and pose this to Andreas. Um, how do you think the aviation sector will compete with other sectors for some of these new fuels? Is that a consideration? Do you foresee that as an issue? That's, that's the big unknown, uh, I believe. Um, also because there are already policies in place that allocate um, you know, um, biofuels to the road transportation sector, for example. Uh, the low carbon fuel standard, for example, in, in, in the US, or the California, I don't know the details anymore, um, which, which um, you know, distorts the, the, the picture, of course. And, and ultimately, you would think the sector that has the strongest, um, you know, challenge in terms of substituting fuels or reducing CO2 emissions would have the highest willingness to pay for, for um, that car's uh, resource. But, but given the distortions in place, uh, of course, it, it's questionable what the outcome uh, will be, it depends on, on, on the policies. Um, ideally, you would remove all of these distortions and subsidies and, and regulations and then let the market decide. And, and presumably in this case, uh, aviation would, would um, uh, be willing to pay the highest price. Thank you, Andreas. Adding on to that, moving, um, Andreas has mentioned uh, the, the cost and the, and the pricing. Um, what role does carbon taxation play in the results that uh, the outlook presents? Um, perhaps this is a question for Luis. Um, how does carbon taxation uh, feed into both, well, aviation uh, demand as well as the other modes that we that we look at? Yes, thank you, Mauriti. Uh, carbon taxation. Uh, present uh, a big challenge also for the changing on the cost structure of, uh, of, uh, of aviation and other, and other modes. But currently in the, in the model, it's mainly on trip production. Uh, we have some trips that get frustrated that uh, because some of them go on model transfer, but it's for uh, trips that are more compatible with other modes in ranges, especially as Dimitris mentioned, lower than 1,000 kilometers, and there is uh, a land connection. Uh, if not, uh, th uh, we are talking mainly about uh, trips that are the that are su uh, suppressed. Uh, but the suppression with the levels the, the, of carbon taxation that we tested, they are not enough to really make a, a, a significant reduction on demand. We are talking uh, on, a, on an increase that could go up to 10% of prices for medium long haul uh, 
and 10% or, or 15% of increase of, of the pricing of a ticket, this doesn't really change uh, us to back to the levels of, uh, of the 90s, especially if we are still going forward uh, with the costs that are steadily preserving and we see that the GDP per capita is still increasing. Then I think there is here a challenge also in the level of the carbon taxation that we impose, that if, if uh, we see that the technology, as uh, Andrea has mentioned, is an advance as enough for us to reach the targets, we have to really able to uh, be able to to better uh, use some tools that will control demand if we want really to achieve the market. Then we have is to compensate and assess what is the the, fun, uh, the, the outcome of, for the economy also for some constraint on the, on the aviation. And this is a, a more theoretical exercise that goes beyond what we explored in the ITF outlook. But, but I think this is quite important also to see the, 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 the spillovers of this measure. Thank you, Luis. Um, it's good to understand the modeling uh, uh, theory and application behind this. Uh, Vatsalia, perhaps a question for you, building on this idea of carbon taxation. It is rather controversial, and we've seen around the world that it's not necessarily an easy measure to implement. Can you talk a little bit more about how we can make sure that implementation is fair and, um, and does not unfairly burden certain populations? Thank you so much, Manavi, for that question. Uh, indeed, um, it is, uh, we've, we've seen it in the last few decades even, that the uptake of carbon taxation has been met with opposition and has been very slow. Uh, this is mainly because um, apart from uh, the complexity of implementing these uh, taxes, they're also often regressive in nature. So what happens is they affect lower income households more than they would uh, impact um, higher income households. So uh, there's, there's a lot of opposition in the acceptance of these measures. Now, there are ways to make uh, carbon taxation more fair and just, and this can be through making carbon taxation revenue neutral. So we've already seen this in a, in a lot of countries, actually. There's uh, examples from Sweden, Denmark, even Canada, where the revenue uh, generated from these taxes is uh, used to maybe offer labor subsidies, or to fund cleaner alternatives at the same time, or even cases where uh, introduction of taxes on, on energy products has been complemented with a reduced income tax rate. So there are ways of making these um, taxation mechanisms fairer and more just, um, and making sure that they don't unfairly impact uh, the vulnerable groups. At the same time, I think, uh, as has been mentioned already, it's very important to complement carbon taxation with uh, cleaner alternatives and deploying, uh, say, charging infrastructure, especially in the case of non-urban transport, uh, non-urban passenger transport, along uh, regional and intercity routes where uh, uptake of these cleaner modes is, is a bigger uh, problem than in urban areas. Um, I think I will, I will stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, Vatsalia. Um, so we've talked about carbon taxation. Uh, we have a one question from our audience that asks about purchasing carbon credits for travel. Um, Demetrius, I'll, uh, I'll ask you about this first. This seems to have been a bit of a fad for a while for tourism or business. Um, is this still a scheme that is ongoing or on the horizon? Um, is, does it have, what kind of effect does it have? Demetrius, perhaps you could kick us off. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I mean, when we talk about carbon taxation, uh, we do have a variety of measures. Uh, per case, uh, carbon credits could be one of them, um, would, would be characterized as a cap and trade scheme. Uh, we do have offsets and ICAO is launching uh, Corsia, uh, which will have um, uh, increased costs when emissions go over a certain level. We could even have a direct tax that is imposed uh, that is imposed on emissions. Now, whether this is a FAD, maybe the I believe the, the system was not ready for that. I do believe that if we want to advance uh, and encourage the adoption of new technologies, some sort of pricing mechanisms will be necessary. Now, obviously, as a user, as a customer, you would not want to pay more or 
a large segment of the population would not want to pay more. So it needs to it, it's something that needs to be put in place with great urgency because uh, the whole uh, the whole discussion about the climate it's not it's more than a discussion it's an urgency and acting now would allow us to reduce our emissions faster. Thank you, Demetrius. I have a question on high-speed rail versus air. This was a discussion that we that Andreas brought up and, and we discussed uh, during the poll. Um, Luis, perhaps you could take a first um, attempt at this and Andreas, Demetrius, if, uh, Vatsalia, if you would like to come in, just, uh, just signal. Um, are there specific known locations or regions where high-speed rail is available or um, is planned where it would be more efficient to use air travel due to it not being a dense area? Thank you, Mauriti, for the question. I'd say it's also how you define efficient, because if it's efficient from an energy perspective or emissions or efficient from economic perspective, as Andreas mentioned, you need a, a certain level of demand to be justified and be to cost effective and for to justify the operation and the maintenance of all, all the of all the of, of the rail tracks and also the the the, the vehicles, then there is another component that is the viability of the rail high speed rail connections to to exist and then if you consider all the cost benefit not just the emissions yes there are cases that have been proven even that uh, air connection would have even a, a cost benefit uh, higher than the high speed rail but uh, depends on how you define then the efficiency and how you uh, internalize the the cost and the benefits on on the, on on the contabilization the account thanks louise um, one one point that Andreas brought up during uh, his uh, his part was about the long lifetimes of planes. Uh, around thirty years, I believe, was the number quoted. Um, would it make sense to, from an environmental or economic perspective, to retire aircraft early? Something similar to car uh, vehicle scrappage schemes. Is this something that is being looked at? Has it been looked at? Is it effective? Would um, Andreas, perhaps, I'll start with you. Well, it, it has happened in the past, but not often, of course, because it's a very expensive measure. And this was um, as a result of the introduction of more stringent uh, aircraft noise regulations, I believe, in the 1960s. Um, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a very expensive measure and, and you need to be desperate if you, if you, uh, you know, uh, move, move into that direction. Thank you. Demetrius, would you like to add to that? Um, well, I, the only thing I would like to add is that in our modeling work in the Outlook, we do consider uh, the increased cost that would come from such a scrap as an early retirement of planes, especially when we are looking at hybrid electric and all electric aircraft. So this is to come in advance of any questions which might say, which might ask if our results take this into account. But I do agree with uh, what Andrea said. Thank you, Demetrius. We are nearly out of time, so perhaps a quick 30 second answer from, um, from Luis. Um, do we look at, uh, so we, we looked at uh, electrifying uh, road vehicles in the model, and we've also mentioned the importance of clean energy grids. It, do we have any sort of analysis included in, in the outlook on um, what the impact of moving to electrification with the current energy grid might look like? Is it actually a net benefit? Uh, yes, and we we have always because uh, combustion engines they are not very efficient even with the increases that we have currently even with the grids that we have currently even in in, in non uh, uh, in areas where they were very uh, carbon intensive they are even reductions and savings on on the switch for for electric the thing is also the infrastructure to be available and and also that could allow electric of course to have a full advantage as much we should ensure that the, the grid is also cleaner it is thank you so people can Go see the outlook for more details on that. Um, that is all we have time for today. Thank you very much um, to my colleagues, Demetrius, Vatalia, Luis, and a very special thank you to Andreas for joining us. Um, it has been lovely having this time to discuss all these very challenging topics with all of you. Um, for those who are interested in more on the outlook takeaways, please visit the 
ITF exhibition stand in the summit portal where you can download the executive summary in nine different languages. Um, you can also visit the ITF webpage where we have links to the publication itself, recordings of these sessions, um, the modeling results that you can download as well. And finally, if you would like to join the last session of the Outlook launch today, we will be focusing on freight transport and it starts in five minutes. You'll need to navigate to it using the back to timeline button on the top left hand corner of your um, screen. Thank you very much again and I hope to see you there.